No, no, we're good. So I don't have any slides or graphs or anything much else other than five key messages that I'd like to talk to you about. But first of all, thanks Craig and, and your organisation, EMV, and everyone who's a party to that for the time this afternoon to, to um, allow me to come and talk to you about where we're at with policy and strategy on climate change in general and some of the particular issues that the current government is very keen to, to reposition Victoria in. So the five key messages, and I'm happy to, to be stopped any point during this presentation with a question or whatever, I'd like to keep it pretty informal if possible. So without further ado, um, the, the five key things are really about re-establishing this jurisdiction, Victoria, as a leader in the climate change policy space and action. So the first point being addressing climate change effectively is critical to the prosperity and well-being of Victorian communities. Regardless of all of the discussion that goes on internationally about the science and all the rest of it, ultimately addressing it effectively is absolutely critical. So without strong action to reduce greenhouse gases, without strong action to implement adaptation strategies, the impact of climate change will pose increasing risks to public safety. So in the emergency services sector, the outcomes of many of those events. So it's absolutely critical. Um, it, it poses increasing risks to infrastructure, public safety, health, and many other services and community infrastructure that we rely on very heavily. So acting on climate change presents enormous opportunities as well. So there's three major opportunities I'd like to bring your attention to. The first is, in spite of what you might hear, acting on climate change is a great opportunity to build jobs and skills in clean uh, industries, to build the economy and to position Victoria to transition to a thriving low emissions uh, economy. Uh, why is that the case and how do we know that? Because other jurisdictions around the globe are doing this. If you go and look at California, you will see, in spite of all of the uh, downturn, the economic downturn through the global financial crisis and all the rest of it, they've effectively decoupled carbon and emissions and all those discussions from economic growth. And what they've been able to do in decoupling it is have strong economic growth but also have all these other emissions reductions and very specific actions on environmental sustainability and climate change to grow the economy. So why do you have big industries like Tesla building the biggest battery factory ever built in California? It's because they've provided the environment in which to do it. It's the economic and policy environment in which to do it. So that's a really important point. Second is uh, the opportunity is to have an informed discussion with the community about climate change, have an informed discussion. That, as you'll have seen, hasn't largely been the case, particularly at the national level for some years. We have a responsibility to have that informed conversation with communities. It's a really important role for government to take that's an opportunity because it gets into resilience discussions at the local level with particular members of the community who, for whatever reason, are already vulnerable and are going to be more vulnerable. Third opportunity, based on having a conversation, is to build resilience. We've got to empower people and we have a lot of history in the, in the work that CFA and other organisations have done, but I know CFA having had some involvement with CFA in the past and through recent events through Black Saturday and all the rest of it, but the community safety space is really important. So the more we can build community resilience, the more we can empower people to make informed decisions, the safer we can create places for people to live, but also the, the risk equation between the risk that government and agencies take on versus the risk that individuals and uh, organisations take on, we get that risk fulcrum set correctly. So that's the first point. It's absolutely critical. Second point. The current Victorian government has committed to establishing or re-establishing Victoria as a leader. Going back some years, Victoria was the leader nationally in this space. 
Minister Neville has said that she wants to re-establish that leadership role. Now, in the last few years, we've lost that mantle, and that's it is what it is. Uh, other jurisdictions have taken on greater leadership roles, have taken on bolder policy stances, have therefore attracted investment that didn't come to Victoria. And that's fact. I'm talking about billions of dollars of investment. So this government wants to say, well, hang on a sec, we want this. We want to be leaders again, so what does it mean to be leaders? So a number of things allow us to reposition Victoria. It's not something you can do overnight, but it's certainly something this government's very committed to doing. If Minister Neville was here, she would tell you this in very strong terms. So what does that give us as a bunch of agencies working together? Well, it gives us a very strong mandate to work collaboratively. Um, the bread and butter of EMV and its success and the partnerships that exist across this sector, uh, that's bread and butter that we need to use in terms of how do we best drive our discussions about leadership on climate change action. So our mandate is to work collaboratively because it's not my responsibility to make this happen, it's my responsibility to cause it to happen in terms of facilitating the discussions and getting it to a point where we can all be part of that. But in the end, it's, it's going to succeed on the basis of... So what policy pieces of this government committed to doing in their election platform I talk about this uh, because you may not know about it, but the election platform talks about some of the things that they're very committed to doing, and I'll say that all of those election commitments, at least 30 plus election commitments have been given to me to implement. Um, the ones that relate to climate change are these ones that I'll talk about. Firstly, the Climate Change Act, which you may be aware of, was proclaimed in 2010, came into effect halfway through 2011. Um, it's been implemented only in part over recent years. Within that Act, there's two triggers for a review. Uh, one trigger is national arrangements for mitigation, um, such as a carbon trading arrangement or a tax or something like that. The other trigger is a time-based trigger, and that trigger has been tripped, and we need to undertake the review this year, a review of the Act which needs to be concluded by the end of this calendar year. So how is that being done? Uh, there's currently an independent committee that we've put together, and that, that's been appointed by the, the Minister with the support of government, and last week public submissions were called for, and there are a number of questions put forward in the submission um, website space, which you can go to, and it's saying to the community, what is it that we need from legislation that enables Victoria to be a leader, in short? How do we best create legislation to enable and facilitate things in, in, a, not, in not a bureaucratic or overly uh, prescriptive or, or paternalistic way, but what does modern legislation provide for by way of climate change and what does it look like. So there is opportunity for, um, for any punter to have a view about this and put forward their submission through that public submission process. So we've set up the secretariat for that. We've appointed the, the uh, independent panel. Um, they sit separate from the department and they're doing their thing, which is terrific and I'm pretty confident that that's the right model and it's the model that this government wanted to put in place. So the outcomes of the review will lead to a, a government response, so there needs to be a response put forward uh, early next year, that needs to be put to parliament and so that's just part of the process. Out of that then it'll be what does that look like for various sectors including this one. So there's an important discussion we need to have in terms of the government response across sectors. Once the independent reports come through, it's gone through government, all that sort of thing, in framing up a response, what does that look like from an industry perspective? The other part of the uh, equation here for, for government in its, early in its term is what are the policies and programs that are currently in place 
being delivered, for example, by Sustainability Victoria. How effective are those? Are they complete? Do they do what they need to do? Is the money going where it needs to go? So there's a bit of a review of programs to make sure that we've got the right community lens put across um, those programs and they're not heading in the wrong direction from a policy standpoint. There's also a commitment to introduce, and the wording is really important here, is because in the election platform it talked about this, an achievable emissions reduction target. And we're in conversation now about what does that look like? And that's part of the broader review because the previous target set within the legislation is that the pro appropriate point you know, for, a, for a target to sit. If there is such a thing as a target, what is that? Where is it set and what does it do? So there's a lot to be worked through from a policy perspective in terms of that legislation. Now I should also reference that outside the work that we're doing with Minister Neville is the work that the Minister for Energy is doing, Lily D'Ambrosio, and that picks up all the renewables and energy efficiency component to the picture because the climate change space is just um, it, it's significant. So it's, a lot of it sits in that renewable energy because our energy mix is a big driver for carbon. So that's the second point, is that there's a, a lot happening at the moment. I'll come to the adaptation plan because that's a really important interface. So third point, for this sector, the climate change policy piece that we're working through is the development of the second statewide adaptation plan. Um, and an element of that is the update of climate science for Victoria. Now, Craig, you held up a copy of that strategy, and this was put forward under the previous government, released in March 2013. Um, and I think it's received a fair bit of commentary, both positive and negative. I guess from a positive standpoint, it was considered to be a very comprehensive and thoughtful uh, bringing together of all action that was either in place or needed to be in place across government. Um, it was cross-sectoral, it focused on regions, it focused on a number of things in a way that weren't, that, that, that I guess were not necessarily expected um, in, in the outside world, so there were some positives. The criticisms largely came from the point of view that it was all about government. That was a deliberate choice of the previous government to make it about the then government policies, programs and services and risks to those government policies, programs and services. It wasn't anything beyond that in terms of what's it like for communities and businesses. So this government and particularly this minister wants to look at that and say, well, both in a developmental sense but also in a policy sense, is that the right footprint for an adaptation plan? Perhaps it's not. Maybe we need to look beyond that. How best do we consider environment society economy at the very local level and that's where I think the big opportunity is for the emergency management sector. Um, we would be very keen to have a broader scope. Uh, ultimately that is a decision of government but in listening to Lisa Neville and she said to me don't bring me anything that hasn't been worked through with the community. Um, don't bring anything to me that isn't something that the community would be happy to see that the government's leading on. So. From that perspective, I would expect that the scope would be broader and we need to work very closely with you on that. Um, it is a whole of government policy document. We'll facilitate it, but in the end, what goes into it is the sum of everything that we think we need to do as a, a bunch of government agencies, but also what do the community and what does business think are important as priorities in adaptation. So, um, we can focus on ourselves, and I think we spend too much time on doing that. We need now, I think through this second adaptation plan, to start focusing on the people out there that we serve day, day to day, and how best do we get adaptation into the minds of everyone that make decisions about whether to build the big black box next to Federation style house and the energy efficiency issues. and solar issues there are all sort of obvious in terms of what that looks like. So is that the right decision to be made and how best do we get people to make more uh, rounded decisions in terms of you know, 
particular matters like building a house. So adaptation is a big challenge and it's best done by the people who are there to make decisions at the very local level, the individuals, it's not best made by um, governments in that paternalistic kind of way. The more governments make and agencies make paternalistic decisions on behalf of communities, we end up wearing the risk and we have communities who are disempowered through um, successive sort of ways of working. So best we empower and get people to make decisions in their own right. Um, in terms of climate science, and I expect you've heard a bit about projections of climate science and some of the work that's being done in looking at the modelling there. There is enough modelling in the world and we're not going to repeat more modelling on climate science and modelling on climate change. What we will be doing is using CSIRO to bring together what does it look like for Victoria and also Bureau of, Met well, Bureau of Meteorology will have a view in that as well. This is required under section 17 of the Climate Change Act that there's an update of science in climate, in, in climate science before an adaptation plan is developed. So we're working with CSIRO and BOM to do that. Uh, it'll get down to a level of granularity that we didn't have available to us previously. What does it look like from a regional standpoint? And the climate science products will be robust, they will be accessible, and we're trying to make them meaningful for the community because if the community can't make sense of what this is, then we can't afford the first hurdle of a discussion about adaptation. Um, what it will also do is provide a signpost into where you can find more credible information in the outside world, more detailed information, and those information tools will be more and more critical because of the online world in which we live at the moment, so churning out the reports and all the rest is probably one thing we don't need to do so much, it's how do we make that accessible to people in every other form. So if you go back to the strict economics of what's the role of government, very clearly giving communities information is fair and square something that governments need to do. Um, so that is, that is a really critical piece. Now we in the industry, in the, uh, in the emergency sector, and I'll talk about it from a particular part of that sector, which is fire management. Every fire season we go into, we have a, a seasonal outlook. It's a very thin slice of what does the next six months look like. The climate science update we're talking about is an aggregation of all the slices over the next 20, 40, 60 years. So we're already dealing with this stuff. Every fire season we go through all the projections seasonal outlook, what's El Nino doing, all those things that we hear that we need to respond to in terms of our fire season preparedness. Uh, those are the things we're already doing annually. How do we make that conversation go over a decadal change in terms of climate? Not just yearly, but decadal. And that's what this modelling, this bringing together of climate science for Victoria will hope to do. So that's, I guess, the, the third point is to talk about that. Um, you've already heard about climate science projections and I won't repeat what's already been said other than we are set to experience a substantial increase in extreme weather events. Um, we already have our share of those with the climate change and particularly the temperature rise projections. It's going to be hotter, longer, drier, longer, and when it's wet, it's going to be a whole lot wetter. And uh, you know that's pretty much the, the non-expert sort of take on all of that. But look, we're going to have an increase in the number of days with a severe fire danger rating projected to increase 25 to 35 per cent by 2030. So that's not a flash looking sort of summation. I mean, the code red declaration risk attached to that is considerable, not only in terms of the, the output risk to communities, but the input risk in terms of agency preparedness, costs, capability and capacity. I mean, they're all big challenges for us to really start to think quite seriously about. 
Um, and that's just the fire bit, there's the heat bit, which is health, there's the, the flood bit. You know, there's all those other components to this, that many of which all come together at some uh, unfortunate point in the same time and place. So, coupled with population growth, uh, urban intensification, intensification around the urban fringe, um, we've got some challenges ahead of us. And I mentioned, you know, budget input costs and input pressures are one. The output costs in terms of risk to community and how do we deal with that. More people out in the landscape and the rest of it. More people who want to make risky decisions about where to live. Um, those are all things that are really complex things. The planning system is a tool for us to use. It's not the solution, though. We've got to get the planning system with the right policies in it to do the work it needs to do. Uh, that's our challenge, is to help the planning system do that, but we can't say the planning system's there to fix it if we don't put the right stuff in it to do those um, things we want it to do. So with these projections, I've already said this, but if you're already vulnerable in the community, you're more vulnerable. We've got structural uh, issues about where people live, about their income, their education, all of those things tend to all conflate the structural uh, inequalities and vulnerabilities are all magnified when you've got this overlay of more heat stress, fire risk, flood risk. It's all amplified. So we've got some challenges. We talked about water. Those flash flooding events are a real problem. Creeks rivers, all those things are, uh, it's not just going camping up on the Murray, oops, something went wrong, or jumping at Gunnamatta when you shouldn't. There's all these other things that are about people in the landscape with significant events that attract the vulnerable, young children or people that shouldn't go near these things that are very risky and you end up with the wrong outcome. So we've got some challenges. So today, and, and I'm very keen to make this clear, we want to talk about principles for addressing climate change in this sector. Well, the, the Climate Change Act sets a number of principles in place. So I would ask you to think about how best to build those principles into the work that's relevant for this sector. What's the role of this sector in the climate change leadership debate. What does, it, what does this sector need to do to be leaders and to lead discussion in this space? So I won't tell you about what principles you need to adopt. Um, I simply wanted to set a policy context. I wanted to uh, ask for your energy, your collaboration, your partnership, goodwill to assist a process that we're going to run with Adaptation Plan Mark II and to use all of your networks to get the outcomes that we're very keen to get from that perspective. The principles in the Climate Change Act relate to informed decision making, integrated decision making, risk management, complementarity, equity and community engagement. So. You could apply those principles pretty much, you could pull them out of the strategic plan, the business plan, the operational plan, the preparedness plan, you know, any of the plans that we as an industry put together, those sit very comfortably from my understanding, my knowledge of the industry. I think they're a great basis upon which to have a discussion. So I encourage you to look at those principles and I'll leave you with some questions. What does leadership in climate change mean for emergency management? What role will you choose to adopt in that leadership? What changes need to occur across the sector to enable it to cope with, adapt to those climate change challenges? What are the risks and opportunities as government restores its leadership position. 
So how do we grasp those opportunities is more the point. And what does the emergency management sector need to do to take advantage of, the, of those opportunities? So I'd like to leave it there and thank you again for asking me to come along. I'm very happy to take any questions or hand back to you, Deb and Craig. So thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, first of all, just a, a quick wrap up um, between now and morning, uh, afternoon tea. Carl, uh, John, and Paul have been able to actually put on the table um, the real emphasis of what this is about evidence, um, research, science, policy positions, commitment of government that is community focused. Those words are really important in the sense that um, sometimes, and I think Paul hit it on the mark, sometimes we set policy that isn't community focused because it's about government and agencies. And if you read what's on that chart there, we've spent time the last little while, uh, and Paul's been a part of this, to make sure that communities and business are absolute players in what we're doing. And that's the game changer. Because if we think we're going to do it to them, and we're going to sit back in our little shelter sheds and dream up the world, we get it wrong every time. So that poster there is absolutely critical. Now, you take it a little bit further um, and you think about what John said and it was all about economics in the main. Um, in our business, we've, we're in the business of safety, primacy of life, but not very long down the track before it actually becomes driven by economics. Um, I can take an example of a community in the North East that had a fire around them and were really upset about not having access to the community for three weeks. And the report that was done was all about safety. And I had the pleasure to go up there and deliver this six months later. And they'd moved on. Actually, they'd moved on about the safety issue about three weeks after or during the fire. And it was all about livability, survivability and economics. And the economics is the backdrop that's really important to understand where we are, which takes you to resilience. And if you've got resilience, it's not just about community resilience, it's total resilience. It's organisational resilience, it's resilience in communities, in the economics of the community, because this is that well-being, livability and sustainability. Really important sequence of words about our business, our sector. Well-being, Justin, in health, what it is, it's about well-being of the, of the people. The second thing you move into then, when you, when you start to crunch the infrastructure, it's about livability and straight after that it's about sustainability in communities. And the reason I want to just jump up and talk about where Paul is, is that's where I think we've got strategic leadership out of Paul's group and Adam Fennessy at DELP that is quite inspirational and changing the environment we're in. DELP is one of the government departments that is leading this and leading this with absolute passion. I have that in my hand as Paul jumped up. Now, you may not have read that. But that document is fundamental. That went across to the states with me. There's not too many t documents I took to the states. That was one of them. Now, that document, um, if you read it, is underpinned by emergency management through it, and it's not in the traditional way of emergency management. It, we were able to influence that through discussion um, in the development of what is phase one of a document that was absolutely critical. Holly was our representative at the time, and it wasn't easy. Because we were seen as an industry in the emergency services, and I'm using a different word there, emergency services worth of emergency management about uh, the response phase and not understanding what we offer in the planning and the aftermath. Hence why the before, during and after is a systems approach to what we do. And I'm not giving you a lecture, I'm just trying to set the tone for this afternoon because it's really important. Um, one of the new challenges to Victoria is fast moving water. Paul Bennett works in Paul's area, uh, leads the Victorian floodplain strategy, it's out for consultation at the moment, and I've got the job in another space to um, chair the Metropolitan floodplain strategy for 2050 for Mel on behalf of Melbourne Water. They are game changers as well. Urbanisation will see us catch water different, the water will flow in the communities different, it's a different capability and we will see, and that's why I was hence asking the question about impacts, John, of of impacts of water safety because we will see in the next short period of time significant fast moving water in non-traditional areas because of urbanisation. Have a look at LA, full of drains. LA is not a well planned city I would have thought um, in the sense that it's actually carrying a concrete city in a flat piece of country that collects lots of water. 
and it's got lots of drains in it. And those drains actually have a large percentage of loss of life because they're actually in, in people's um, playgrounds, that's where people play sometimes. Now, the other thing about, in, and, I, and I don't want to give you a lecture at all, but EMV is a sector. Emergency Management Victoria is about us as a sector. It's not an organisation that I sit up in, in uh, level 23, 121. If you read the stuff we've written, the vision of EMV is about a safer, and more resilient community, which means all of us have that vision. The, the, the goals is about we work as one and we work in conjunction with government agencies, community and business to get there. So when we talk about EMV and Paul looks at me, yeah, I've got a job to lead EMV, absolutely, but Paul's got the same level of ownership of EMV as what I've got. And that's that partnership that we have to bring across this whole environment of where we are. Very important. And I welcome the fact that if you think about Paul opening up the opportunity to this and the challenges he's put to us, this forum and the series of discussions that we have will put us in a position that we'll be able to influence, contribute and be leaders in this sort of strategy policy document at, at, at government level. So absolutely critical. Now, just the last um, thing. Uh, leadership, accountability, integration, agility are the four things we've talked about as a sector. We have to do that as a sector. We've got to be strong in leadership, we've got to be accountable for actions, we've got to be integrated, but we've got to have agility. This is the agility bit, because we've got to change. If we keep doing the same old, same old, if we live behind uh, the fact we've been recognised as good organisations, you know what? We'll be questioned one day when we all do it wrong. It's about us together doing it and being community focused and definitely upstream. If you haven't read them, read the latest state health plan. Read the latest pandemic plan, which I only signed off a couple of weeks ago. Uh, both those plans, and there's a guide around them, signed off by the um, State Resilience uh, Council, uh, are changes. Because at state plans, we used to talk about how do we put um, uh, treatments into the, into the hazard. These ones are written around collaboration, community, talks about how we'd manage it, and it talks about how we will deal in the communications of it. Now, it's got a lot of C words in there. Prue's sitting in here. Prue leads that on behalf of Tony Murphy. Game changes in the way in which we see these state plans. Absolute game changes and exactly what Paul's saying. They start to build in a different set of principles. Now, the only reason I wanted to share that with you, because I don't think all of you would know that, um, you haven't had the chance to read all those documents, but it tells us that we're in a really strong position to have the collaborative discussion to change the way we're doing it. And with Paul's leadership and Adam Fennessy's leadership and Lisa Neville's leadership, we'll get someone together. We will get there. So I just thought that that's worth mentioning, a new approach, a new opportunity, and we've got a, um, the opportunity to, to influence it significantly. Thank you. You're almost done. Right. I just wanted to ask if you could all please thank Paul oh, well, for his presentation as well. I know it's <laughs> good. good news, everyone. We're at the Windsor where they make scones. And I'm sure they are going to be absolutely delicious. It's time for a very short break. Um, after the break, we 